be seated, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. Looked at a scripture reading and the, the opening hymn. And we are told by the connoisseur that the immunologist that that hymn in itself defines what a hymn is supposed to be. It's not about us. You see, a song is different from a hymn that says, God is holy. The Trinity, they are holy. Amen? And the scripture reading, when the king of Zion died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And they cried out, holy. What a message that God has for us today. What a word will be coming to us from Pastor Garth Smith. Certainly a man of God. We have known Pastor for several years now, as a matter of fact. When New Life was somewhere else, he came and he, to the aid of the Holy Spirit, brought messages to God's people. We are happy to have him here with us today. Uh, he has served the West Jamaica Conference for a number of years. And some of us who are from uh, West Conference, way down there in Montego Bay area, that western section of the, the island, may have some passing with Pastor Smith. Currently, he's married. Two children, right, Pastor? You know, I got a little mix-up sometime this week. I saw his little boy was a little bigger. But he said, oh, he can do such tests for two. <laughs> two beautiful young children. And I believe that God has laid upon his heart a message for this congregation. When we started... Uh, looking for projects in which to get involved in. We called a number of individuals. And one person that responded in a positive was Pastor Smith. And from that day forward, we have been involved in Project 1 and now Project 2. We thank him for his faithfulness and his devotion to the work of God. Currently, He's at a church in West Palm Beach. He's pastoring a church in West Palm Beach. They have a little bit more real estate than we do. And I wish we could get we could exchange with him. But to God be the glory of working the hours too. Amen? Amen. He's here with a message from the throne room of the omnipotent. And I pray that as he delivers this message today, hearts will be born for God's eternal kingdom. Keep a prayer in your heart. For Pastor Smith, that God will continue to use him and that he will stand in the gap, especially in times like these. In times like these, we are reminded to the prayer that we need a Savior. And thank God we have a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. Won't you say amen? amen. Are you really happy to hear God's word? Yes. Well, there's a message for you and there's enough for everyone. Let us pray. Our Father, may it be our prayer today that each of us would rather have Jesus than anything. Come over us now in copious showers. Cover us, Lord. Bless our listening ears as we listen. Take me now and hide me behind your cross. Let nothing of my words, nothing of myself, nothing of my knowing be known today but Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for stopping by here today. Thank you for tabernacling with us, for setting up tent with us today, Lord. Our hearts are filled. We ask that you'll just pour out now. And may your glory shine forth in this place. We pray. Amen. Singing messenger, thank you for that beautiful song. Real beautiful song. It's good to be here with you today. 
and I want to thank Pastor Wilson for his invitation to stand in his place here today. He spent a little bit too much time on me in the introduction, but I'll forgive him on that. It is just wonderful to be here today. Amen. And as we get engaged in this moment, I'd like to set some rules, Pastor. That's all right. I call these rules of engagement for the next hour. All right, all right. I promise not to be so long. But for the next few minutes that we are together, I just want to ask for you to, to just engage with me. The first is that I'm going to ask you to pray for me like you have never prayed for a preacher. Amen? Amen. 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 Then I'm going to ask you to pray that God will bless your listening ears so that you would receive his blessings in a fashion you've never received before. Thirdly, I'm going to tell you the reason for my sermon today before I preach the sermon. Right. So that there is no one that's left unclear about the reason for that sermon. We have come to a pivotal point in the history of humanity. We have come to a very serious point in the history of humanity. Yes, sir. There is a storm that's coming on God's people on this earth. The church is in trouble. Our homes are in trouble. But we do not seem to have realized how serious this problem is. We have been called as a church to preach a very special message in this time. But yet the message is not being preached. We have been called for a very special purpose in this time of her history. And yet that purpose is not being fulfilled. This is the reason for my sermon today. I just want you to bear that as a background as we get into, get engaged in the message that God has for us today. Is there another mic pastor that probably a stand or something? I like to, to speak without my hands being, being tied down. Wow. I don't know if you, how many of you are aware that the mark of the beast is about to be established. Hmm? I don't know how many of us are aware that Jesus Christ is coming soon, not like when you used to hear it before and you have taken it for a cliche. This time is for real. I just want to share as a background before I get into my sermon a couple of things with you in this regard. Thank you. Have you ever heard of the Dominion Movement? I'm just going to talk with you for a minute before we get into the deeper stuff. The Dominion Movement is a movement that got started about, about 15 years ago. It was started by a man, the father of Senator Cruz, and it has spread across the country as wildfire. Many are not aware of it. It's the same movement that has placed a council of protestant preachers in the halls of the White House as counsel to the president. First time in the history of the United States that, is, that a group of theologians now sees with the president as spiritual guide. This movement is bent on uniting state and church together. It's called the Dominion Movement. Their focal target is that the church must rule the state. For those of us who have just a little inkling, 
just a small understanding of history knows what the end result will be. Today as we stand, between the years 2015 and 2018, 2019, the Protestant movement has joined hands with the Catholic Church. They have announced that the protest is over. The relevance of Martin Luther is no more. We have come to this time we have been called in this moment we have been beseeched for this time with a special message for the world For that reason today, the Lord has given me a message. I just want to take a few moments to bring our attention to the nature of the holiness of God. The nature of the holiness of God. See, brethren, the world is in the problem that is in today because the world has forgotten who God is. The world has lost sight. The church, if you please, has lost sight of who God is. We have betrayed our witness of the Most High. But God wants to do something special with his church in this time. Praise God. He's about to do something wonderful to, in God's church. And I'm telling you, brethren, that God is about to give you a vision of who he is like you have never seen him before. The question is today, are you ready to receive the vision of his holiness? I invite you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 6. It's a text that I know that many of us have read many times, but I just want to take a few verses from that chapter as we meditate on them today and to see God's message for us in a new light. I submit to the church today this fact that any understanding of the meaning of sin must begin with an understanding of the holiness of God. I'll repeat that. If we must understand the meaning of sin, we must first understand the holiness of God. You see, God is the benchmark in which we gain an understanding of what sin is. It is true that every culture, every society differentiates the sacredness from the secular and has terminology to make such differentiation, such distinctions. If we go back to the experience of the Israelites, as they were getting ready to go over into the promised land. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 15 we read that God gave Moses a very special message for these people. He, tell, he told them specifically that you should not worship in the manner that the Canaanites worship. 
In fact, he said, I want you to go over there and I want you to destroy everything that's there and every person that's there. Just in case you begin to adopt their lifestyle. When Israel adopted themselves in this new culture, they adopted this new language. The problem was that what was holy to the Canaanites was abominable to the Israelites. In Canaan, the temple prostitutes were called holy women. The homosexual priest was a holy man. Genesis 38, 21 to 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Verse 17 to 18. You may just write those down and just reread them as you get home this afternoon. You see, sin is defined by any person's concept of who they think God is. And I'll stop there for a moment and repeat that. Sin is defined by any person's concept of God. The nature and holiness of God. The difficulty before us today, there is a challenge. And that is how do we understand the holiness of God? How we do understand the holiness of God determines if we serve the true God of the Bible or we serve a false God of our own makings. Who is your God? Who is your God? As we turn our attention to the book of Isaiah, and as we reflect on the experience of this young minister, Isaiah was a Christian man, if I may say. Don't watch my theology. But he was a godly man. He had already accepted the call to ministry. The prophetic ministry. He was a good friend and mentee of the King Uzziah. And as the record tells us that King Uzziah was a good man. He was a righteous man. But for 16 years up to his death, he suffered from the disease of leprosy. And somehow I believe that this distracted Isaiah from the work and the purpose to which he was called. And the Bible tells us that in the 16th year of Isaiah's sickness, the year that he died, Isaiah pronounced that I saw the Lord high and lifted up. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. It is strange in the language that after being a prophet for so many years, after having accepted the call to ministry, after having been to church every Sabbath, after having studied and understand all the prophecies, that after such a long time that Isaiah would say that just now I see the Lord. But 
there is something strange about the experience. You see, God was about to do something special with Isaiah. God was about to do something special with the church. You see, Israel had come to a pivotal point in their history. Israel had come to a point where God knew that there was going to be trouble ahead. God knew that the storm was coming upon the children of Israel. God knew that the, the kingdom of Judah was about to encounter a spiritual darkness that they have never seen before. And God was preparing his people for this period. So God did something like he always did. He came to his manservant, to his people, through his manservant. And he opened his eyes. And he brought a revival beginning with the pastor. He instituted a reformation. It began with a vision. A vision that would restore God. That would restore worship to where it belonged. A vision that took God from amongst the people and lifted him up and placed him high where he should be. It began with a vision that restored God to his throne. You see, I, I said earlier that we are faced with a challenge and a problem and I just want to touch on that a little while, a little bit. You see, folk, our problem that we face today is that we have become too familiar with God. I was hoping the church would have said amen. I'm going to say it again, brethren, is that we have become too familiar with God. You see, we have taken God from his throne. We have taken him into the pews. And what we have done is that we begin to converse with him like he's our child. Like he's our brother. Like he's our friend. And we forget that he's God. Do we serve the true God or a false God of our own makings? I say to you, to the church today that we are not at leisure. We are not at leisure to define God as who we want him to be. We are not at leisure to define God as it is convenient for us. God defines himself. God defines his nature. God defines his holiness. He is a standard by which all judgment is taken. He is a standard by which all sin is defined. I say to us today that any holiness in man must be the, the same as the holiness in God. Else there is no significance in the command of Peter where he says to obedient children of God become, and the hearer is here in the, in, 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 in the, in, in the Greek, become he yourselves also holy for I am Holy. Amen. The heriest there, friends, let me just explain to you. It's not found in the English language. It's only in the Greek. And when it says here that, let, that, that you must be holy, it is a command. We don't have a choice in the matter. If we're going to be identified with him, we must become holy as he's holy. That's what Peter was trying to tell us, Pastor. We have no choice in the matter or else what we are doing is that we are breaking, we are breaking the commandments which says we should not take the name of the Lord in vain. So it's either we step back or we step up. 
But we must make a decision. There are no gray areas in the kingdom of God. There is no on the line. God calls us to be holy. And he expects us to be holy. There is a widespread agreement among Bible scholars that holiness in scripture takes its essential meaning from what God is. You see, God is not holy because of. You see, God's holiness is not an effect of something or someone. You see, God's holiness exists because God exists. In other words, brethren, I just want you to stay with me for a moment. God's holiness is not attributable to him as an aspect or a part, portion of him. Are we clear in that? Holiness exists because God is. R.C. Sproul makes the insightful observation from Isaiah chapter 6. He says, the Bible says that God is holy Holy, holy. Not that he's merely holy, he says, or even holy, holy. He is holy, holy, holy. The Bible never says that God is love, love, love. He never said that God is merciful, merciful, merciful. It never said that God is wrath, wrath, wrath. But that he is holy. Yes. Is that he is holy. Yes. Is that he is holy. Amen. And that the whole, the whole earth is full of his glory. He is thrice holy. That is the God that we serve. I challenge us today that the holiness of God is a redemptive holiness. What I mean by that? The Bible tells us that as we encounter, as we encounter God, something happens to us. We become changed. Amen? And then I want to challenge us with these three, these two ideas. That the holiness of God is a redemptive holiness. This holiness leads us into repentance. Secondly, that the holiness of God is a reformative, a reformative holiness. And this holiness brings us into worship. Amen? Let me ask you to stay with me for another couple of minutes as I explain these two concepts. You see, because we have forgotten who God is, because we have, Straight away from God, like Judah, like Israel. We fail to recognize the ugliness of sin. And let me speak with us as a church for a moment and excuse me. Remember now that I don't know you. And pastor didn't tell me anything about you. So that gives me the liberty to speak to you yes. as a stranger. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you happen to have been to a Seventh-day Adventist church lately. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if you have happened to, to, to having gone to a Seventh-day Adventist church on a Sabbath. To sit while the pastor is preaching and look across the aisles. I don't know if you ever happened to see cell phones and mobile devices. People of God pretending that is the Bible they're reading. Children playing games. And it's okay with mom and dad. I don't know if you've been to a Seventh-day Adventist church lately. And it so happened that the pastor just completed his sermon. The doors are open. I don't know if you've been there. But the conversations begins to change. I don't know if you have seen. When the brethren begin to press the button. That begin to change from, you know what I'm taught, the sanctimonious state. That, that button that you press when church is finished and you are no longer pious and sanctimonious. But you become again the pagan that you were six days before. I don't know if you've been to a Seventh-day Adventist church lately. And you hear the conversations on the Sabbath day. I don't know if you've been to a Seventh-day Adventist church and listened to the dialogues over lunch. God help his church. But this is the condition. This is the condition of the church that should be preaching the three angels message in the last day just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. I said earlier today, the reason why I'm preaching the sermon today, brethren, is that we are in a glove. We have been stuck. We have become stuck in a quicksand of spiritual wasteland. And we can't seem to get ourselves out. We are unable to preach the three angels' message, brethren. Simple fact is that there is too much sin in our lives. We are unrepented. We are unwilling to surrender to the power of God. When last of your experience is supernatural? I'm not a Pentecostal now. But when last, brethren, have we experienced the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost? When last have we longed for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in our hearts? When last have we felt the saturating power of the Holy Ghost in our souls? Something tells me today that somebody is longing. Something tells me that somebody needs to desire a little more than what they have today. Something tells me that there is somebody here that needs a little more of the Holy Ghost. Somebody tells me. Somebody tell me today that that is true. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah saw the vision clearly. There was something happening in heaven. 
the sufferings, the angels attended worship. And as they went, as they did, their wings were folded in recognition of the holiness of God. And the Bible tells us, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy. If you turn your Bible with me to Revelation chapter 4, you'll see another scene similar to that of Isaiah. Revelation chapter 4. And round about the throne. Let me hear the church say amen. amen. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto the crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, the third beast as a face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. I want the church to say with me, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come. Let me get with the second point I made here, and I'll get back to the first. Is that in recognition of the holiness of God, it brings us into worship. If you turn to Revelation chapter 14, we find that the first angel's message does something. I want you to stay with me here for a second. What does it say, the first angel's message? It's a call to, to fear God and give Glory to him and worship him. Why did God need at this time to call the earth back to worship? Because we have gone astray. We have failed to recognize that he is the God that is holy thrice. Yes, we fail to recognize, to realize that he is holy, holy, holy. Amen. And because we have failed to recognize this holiness, we have sunken into sin. For what, what ha begins to happen is that we begin to define sin by our terms. We begin to conveniently rationalize. Let me ask you a question, brethren. I'll ask you a very important question. Do you remember? Do you remember? When you made a mistake. And you felt so ashamed. Because you know it was sinful. Do you remember those days? Just after you got baptized? Do you remember, don't you? The week after you got baptized. When you knew. When you remembered the holiness of God. When you had no. Nothing. To stop you from seeing the glory of God. 
when there were no obstruction and the novelty of his presence and his devotion was just there. What happened? What happened, brethren? What happened that took you to the place that you could come to church on Sabbath and while service is going on here, you decided it's okay to have another service on the house side? What happened? You come to church and you decide to sit in the pews and talk any kind of stuff, any way you feel because you feel like it. What happened? What happened, brethren? What happened? Somebody come up here who's not a Seventh-day Adventist one Sabbath afternoon and they can't believe you're a Seventh-day Adventist because you're not different from them. And let me define what holiness is now. Scholars, Bible scholars, have determined and have agreed that the word holiness, both in the New and the Old Testament, significantly means a distinction. It means that to be separated. It means that a cut above. It means that you are individually separated from the others. So when the Bible calls God holy, 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 it is saying that God is cut above us three times above. And when God says that by Peter that we should we, we, we should be holy as is commanded. He's saying that we are expected to be like him three times Amen. cut above the rest. Amen. Distinct. But these days we are not even distinguished. Doesn't it break your heart? Yeah. When you think about your condition. Does it bother you? Or you are too acclimatized to sin? You know, there's a story that tells us, um, it, it is said that if you put some frogs in cold water and you take your time and, and adjust the temperature, what's going to happen is that eventually as the, as the temperature increases, it will cook these frogs alive. Why? Because they become so comfortable that they do not realize the change that has come. There is a change that has come, brethren. There is a change. The temperature has risen. The climate is different. We have a world today. We live in a community that there is a natural agreement that God is no longer holy. There is a common agreement that sin is not sin if it's not convenient. We have come in a place where Seventh-day Adventist pastors have openly protested that the Bible needs to be changed to accommodate the modern lifestyles of its people. We have come to this time. The temperature has changed. We have come to a time when our pastors have decided that the Bible is too harsh on the act of homosexuality. And because of that, those sections of the Bible are no more relevant. We have come to this time where is the holiness to which God has called us? See, brethren, <clears throat> the most deficient, deficient, deficient view of sin and grace are to be found in the imbalanced view of who we think God is. We know from scripture that God is love. We know that he is all powerful. 
we know that he's omnipresent. Um, omnipresent. We also know that God is omniscient. But all of God's attributes are not equal put together to his holiness. You see, holiness is the primary attribute of God. All other attributes must be in subjection to his holiness. Part of. Holiness occupies the foremost of God's character. It is God's character, in fact. Because the fundamental character of this, of our God, is that he is holy. I'm asking the church today to make a decision. You might have been baptized many years ago. Some of you here might have been baptized before I was born. Many of you here are not yet baptized or has been recently baptized. I'm going to make an appeal today in the next few minutes. I want you to think about it. I'm going to make an appeal to you to make a consecrated decision, to make a distinction today between the God that you served and the God that you should serve. I want you to make a decision today. As we go back to Calvary and see his act of redemption, I want you to stay with me now and I want you to just picture for a moment what it cost God to reveal to us his ultimate holiness. Calvary. Calvary. Wounded for our transgression. Calvary. Bruised for this human race. Calvary. The cost was too great. A sword in his side. Calvary. Would you reject today the price that he paid? Calvary. Hanging there on the hill. Clothed in my garment. Wounded in his side. Because of my sins. His head bowed in shame. Because of my disobedience. Calvary. That was the price. God was willing to pay. For his holiness. What we do today. With that. Kind. Compassionate. Gift of love. will matter tomorrow. How can I? The songwriter says, reject such a high price. How can I deny the blood that Jesus shed I ask you the question today, 
How can you? I'm coming to the cross. I am poor. I'm blind. But I'm coming to the cross, Jesus. I am coming to the cross because you died on Calvary. I'm coming to the cross because late on Thursday evening I watched the heathen put the nails in the hand of the strap. I watched them beat you across the back. I watched the blood spilled as you carried that old cross up to Calvary. So I am coming to the cross, Jesus. While the burden was too heavy for you to carry, I watched the man, the Ethiopian, came over and helped you carry the burden of that cross. So I am coming to the cross today. Somebody here today. What is it that would prevent you today from accepting the price paid on Calvary's tree? What is it as we stand together and sing? It is said that love held Jesus to the cross. I submit to us today that it was holiness that necessitated the cross. In this moment, I invite every single one of you into an encounter with God today. I invite you into a supernatural encounter with the Holy Spirit. If there is someone here today, you haven't given your life to Jesus, but you have recognized today the need to come close to him. I would like to pray with you today. I'm going to ask you to leave your seats and come out here to meet me. You have not yet given your life to Jesus. Today, you would say, I am trusting Lord in thee. It may not be today, but sometime soon you would like to make that final decision for Christ. Now is the opportunity. You have been baptized for some time, but you know that you have messed up. You have been stuck in the quicksand of the wasteland of sin. I'm going to ask you to join me here because you want to stop going in the spiral, that roller coaster you have intended today, you have decided today. That you're going to stand. Unfolded and broken. This is an opportunity for you. To rededicate your life to Jesus. To start anew. To put yesterday behind you. I'd like to invite the church. To come forward to join me. Amen. You want to move forward from this point onward in your Christian walk. 
on a higher spiritual level on a higher spiritual ground you want your life to be a testimony of the holiness of Jesus Christ I invite you to join us here today Oh, the Lamb of Calvary. demands that salvation must be more than just a moral justification of sin it demands also that we lead a change from within that we must begin the change from the inside out as we make this commitment today it is my prayer that God will seal this and will lift this community because of this church. Amen. Will elevate this culture because of this place. Amen. It is my prayer that we will leave this place today with a greater understanding of our need to put God where he belongs. Amen. To see God high and lifted up yes, like Isaiah. To recognize that God is calling us into a place to recognize his holiness because he wants to do something powerful, something great, something big with our lives individually and as a church. Remember Moses at a burning bush. God showed him a glimpse of his glory. A glimpse of his holiness because he was preparing him to redeem the children his children out of Egypt. God is about to do something great with this place. Each and every one of you is called in this moment for a purpose. I ask you today, brethren, please let go and let God surrender. Ask him today to take everything that you are and everything that you have Depossess yourself so that he can possess you today. Amen. Fall on him so that you can be broken. So that he may, might have a chance to build you over. Yes. Now is that opportunity. Yes. Because he wants to do something great and powerful and supernatural in your life. More than you have ever dreamt. More than you have ever imagined. Yes, but you must let him. Yes. You must let him. Like Isaiah did. You must let him. Like Moses did. You must let him. Like Anna did. Oh what a wonderful day. When the powers of heaven. The gates of heaven. The windows of heaven are opened. And God would have poured all his glory. Onto this earth. Oh what a day. I'm going to invite pastor to join me here. As he pray for us today. Let us bow our heads and pray. Pray like you have never prayed. That God will do the transforming work in your life that you have never experienced. And that you will leave here ready. Ready. A 
anointing in the sanctuary. There is a in the atmosphere. Oh, come lay down the burden view of slavery for in the sanctuary. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Wake the glue. Oh, yes. the Lord. Almighty God, Almighty Savior, our great High Priest, it is to you we come. Lord, we thank you for your man servant. We thank you, Lord, for the message that you laid upon his heart. Even though, Lord, souls are rejoicing. It is a message for every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl. Lord, like Isaiah, remember how he saw the Lord seated on his throne, high and lifted up, and his glory filled the temple. Lord Jesus, I don't know, but you know who must die. So that we can see Jesus. What is it? What is our King Uzziah? Lord for some people. It's the worldly pleasure. For some people. It's unholy living. For some people. It's fornication. Must die. For some people Lord. It's Sabbath breaking. We're breaking your commandments. It's lying and stealing and hypocrisy. Oh God, I pray that something, that thing, or those things be died. Kill them, Jesus. So that we can see Jesus high and lifted up. And somebody will cry, Holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We pray that new life will be filled with your glory. There is animosity, Lord, I pray that you remove the stench of that old serpent. Where there is discord that you'll sow unity. Hypocrisy, Lord Jesus. Somebody will come clean. We pray that will be broken. Lord, we are called upon to preach the three angels' messages. Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. When we should worship God. Lord, we have lost sense of your holiness. And we thank you for your reminder. Oh God, we pray that this message will live long and linger long in our hearts. Not only for time, but throughout eternity. Lord, we pray for those who made it to the altar. We pray that you will place your Holy Spirit in your hearts. We pray, God, that they will be holy. The command. To be holy. Be 
because you God are holy Lord Jesus keep us faithful to the end Lord we pray for those who are wallowing in sin the preacher said we should declutter oh God we know the, 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 the preacher once said you are the garbage collector you, you have taken up the garbage and you have recycled us you have placed our feet on higher ground thank you Jesus you are the potter we are the clay mold us today Jesus remove the stony edges Jesus whatever it must do Lord do it today save your people Jesus we pray we need mercy and your grace oh God be with every person here today Lord we pray that new life will experience a new life in Jesus thank you for your messenger thank you for the message we pray, O oh God, that you'll bless Pastor Smith ministry. Grant him prosperity. And as he preached to others, may he himself not be a castaway. O oh God, keep him faithful. And on that day when Jesus Christ shall come, the break that eastern sky to claim your people. My prayer this afternoon that all of us would have made it right to go home to be with you forever. We ask, O oh God, that though we be with those who have not yet surrendered, speak to their very heart so that they will do that is right and pleasing in thy sight before the end comes. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. Dismiss us, Lord. Blessings we pray as from thy worship go away, guiding the conflict all through the day, safe in thy kingdom, I be thy. So we say the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be gracious unto you and lift up his light of his countenance upon you. And give you his peace. Both now and forevermore let God's people say. Amen. amen. And amen. You may be seated for a moment of silent meditation. <laughs>